Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you. I can't begin this introduction without paying uh, homage to Mad Men, not only because our speaker is responsible for Lionsgate involvement with the series, but because unlike many of us here today, he actually remembers the 1960s. And like our mysterious ad man, Don Draper, he's a man of many hats and personas. So, who is John Feldheimer? Is he the dedicated son from Roslyn, Long Island, who earned an honors degree at Washington University? The singer-songwriter who wound up managing artists and television actors? The young New World executive who produced the worldwide soap sensation Santa Barbara and followed that hit with the Emmy-winning comedy The Wonder Years? Is he the ambitious studio suit who orchestrated the expansion of Sony's primetime programming with hits like Mad About You, Dawson's Creek, and King of Queens? Is he the brilliant television programmer who applied his magic to theatrical films, picking up Oscars and profits along the way with films like Monster's Ball, Crash, and Precious? Is he the friend and mentor whose quiet acts of generosity and kindness have earned him the loyalty and respect of hundreds of friends and competitors? Or is he the devoted family man who beams with pride when talking about his wife and children and whom he holds more important than anything else? Of course, John is all of these and more. He's a renaissance man of entertainment with expertise in music, television, film, finance, and management, whose impact on Lionsgate since his arrival in 2000 has been profound. In 10 years, John, along with his partner, Michael Burns, has rebuilt, revitalized, and galvanized a company. And in so doing, they have done the same for all of us who call Lionsgate home. To point out just a few examples, in 1998, Lionsgate had 35 employees at a market cap of $82 million, with limited theatrical distribution, no home entertainment or digital distribution, and a television department being financed on my Amex. We attended MIPCOM amid a deafening cry of bankruptcy imminent rumors. Our biggest theatrical uh, success to date was a French-Canadian hockey comedy. We had no television programming, and although there were only a few of us at the company, the various operating units did not work together or even meet on a regular basis. We were a small collection of individual business people trying desperately to keep our little Lionsgate ship afloat. Enter John Feldheimer and his remarkable corporate makeover and growth campaign, which included the acquisitions of Trimark Pictures in 2000, Artisan Entertainment in 2003, Redbus Films, now Lionsgate UK, in 2005, Debmar Mercury in 2006, Mandate Pictures in 2007, TV Guide Network and TVGuide.com in 2009, and investments in Break.com, Fearnet, Roadside Attractions, Tigergate, and most recently, Pantaleone Pictures. But perhaps John's biggest corporate stroke of genius was the launch of Epix in 2009, along with our partners at Viacom, Paramount, and MGM. The creation of this pay venture sent shockwaves through the entertainment industry, and its recent agreement with Netflix has vaulted it into profitability in record time. John began this turnaround by changing the conversation within the company. He instituted weekly division head meetings, initially with half a dozen people, which today are standing room only in our largest conference room and include executives from Los Angeles, New York, Toronto, London, and Hong Kong. He empowered each of his division leaders to run their businesses as entrepreneurs and emphasize cross-division growth opportunities. He organized our first executive retreat, and when the facilitator couldn't keep up with the type A Lionsgate executives in attendance, John fired him and ran the rest of the conference himself. And in so doing, John convinced everyone that in fact Lionsgate was not going out of business at all, but was going to compete fiercely as the next generation media company of the 21st century. We believed it, 
And with John's guidance and vision, we have done it. Today, Lionsgate revenues are 1.6 billion annually, and we have 850 employees. We release 18 to 20 films per year and just enjoyed a huge success with The Expendables. Our 47 Oscar nominations have resulted in 10 Oscar wins, including Best Picture for Crash in 2005. Our home entertainment division is a powerhouse of mass and niche sales, and in the face of declining revenues for packaged media, has continued to grow its business year on year. We have a tremendous digital distribution team who are mining digital dollars, not pennies, from our 12,000 title library every day. Television has had a similar expansion. On the back of Weeds, Mad Men, and Nurse Jackie, we have built our revenues from nine million in 1998 to 351 million in 2010, with a mix of critical and commercial hits that have garnered 77 Emmy nominations and 17 Emmy wins. Lionsgate Television is part of any conversation about signature scripted programming, and we have just launched Running Wild on Fox, our first primetime network comedy. To imagine Lionsgate succeeding 10 years ago required an expansive vision, unwavering commitment, and supreme confidence. John Feltheimer has that vision, commitment, and confidence, and with those qualities has led our company to previously unimaginable heights. But those who know John well understand that he is never satisfied. Present him an Emmy, and he might say, only one? It's taken us three in a row on Mad Men to convince John that it's a hit. So for John, growing Lionsgate in such dramatic fashion over 10 years is good, but not good enough. He relentlessly pushes himself and the company for better creative, more efficiency, and higher profits. In a few moments, John will stand before you as the personality of the year for MIPCOM. But when I answer the question, who is John Feltheimer, I know that he is, in fact, personality of the decade for Lionsgate. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce my good friend, mentor, and boss, the CEO and co-chairman of Lionsgate, Mr. John Feltheimer. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Kevin, thank you for that very generous introduction. And thank you, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure to be here. I particularly appreciate Kevin's words of praise because, frankly, I'm a little nervous knowing that, believe it or not, one of my toughest critics is here in the audience today. No, I'm not talking about Carl Icahn. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to introduce you to my wife, Lori Feltheimer, attending her first MIPCOM. I'm delighted to be here at MIPCOM this year, and I would like to thank you, Paul, and the entire Reed Meetem organization for honoring me later tonight with the Personality of the Year Award. To tell you the truth, I was feeling pretty good about that until I read an industry blog that said I thought you had to have a personality to win the Personality of the Year Award. But with or without a personality, I've been coming to MIPCOM for 20 years and haven't been here in a while, so I'd like to show you what I've been up to. Bonjour. to break new ground. So you want to play? The vision to anticipate the future. Come on, step into the future. The promise to deliver quality time and again. This is everything I ever wanted. Lionsgate. Creating entertainment that moves our emotions and connects with our lives. Strategic, targeted, and dynamic programming that's a step ahead of all the rest and sets a higher standard. I'm living like there's no tomorrow because there isn't one. This summer, Lionsgate established a new record of North American box office success with the number one movie in North America two weeks in a row, The Expendables. What happened to you? Got my ass kicked. Earning over half a billion dollars for the past year and making headlines like never before. From the highly successful horror franchise of Saw, to the powerhouse crossover comedies of Tyler Perry, to critically acclaimed and Academy Award winning breakthrough productions, Lionsgate is the foremost independent producer and distributor of motion pictures in the world. You're gonna show me. Well, where, where did you expect me to put it? Have you seen the size of this thing? With 
47 Academy Award nominations, Lionsgate is the only independent studio to have won 10 Oscars in 10 years. Lionsgate has raised the bar of excellence with its highly acclaimed original series, Mad Men. I'd love to come through. Weeds. I'm a mother. I've got everything under control. Nurse Jackie. Can you stop twittering and focus, please? And from the award-winning creators of Arrested Development, Running Wild, which diversifies and solidifies Lionsgate's television slate. Yeah. Look who's back from Dubai. And I brought back the pride of Yemen. In your carry-on? <laughs> <laughs> With programming that ranges from syndication successes to hit comedies, dramas, and talk shows. I'm delightful. People love me. Lionsgate is delivering more content to wider audiences on expanding platforms like never before. As one of the most diversified major studios, Lionsgate is redefining the production and distribution of motion pictures, television programming, home entertainment, family entertainment, channels, with a vast library of over 12,000 films. Do you see basic instinct? Well, this ain't that kind of movie. With partnerships in Fearnet, the first on-demand and online horror channel, Break Media, a leading digital distribution platform, and Debmar Mercury, the premier independent television syndication company. And with their constantly expanding capabilities, the Lionsgate family continues to grow. Learning Spanish. One of the newest additions to the family is Pantaleon Films, a joint venture between Lionsgate and Televisa. A lot of companies are going to have to look at what we're doing here because uh, people are consuming their media very much differently than they used to. And if you think about the movie The Graduate, the word was plastics. Right now, the word is demographics. And you've got two of the largest entertainment companies in the world uh, delivering content and films to the fastest growing segment of the U.S. population. So we think this is a great idea and we've got a great partner. Pantaleon is the new face of Hispanic entertainment. With films in both English and Spanish, Pantaleon will target the largest growing movie-going demographic in the world. That was amazing. Lionsgate is expanding into new territory across Asia through Tigergate with kicks and thrill. You are on the red carpet with TV Guide Network. TV Guide Network, a fully distributed channel reaching over 80 million homes, has achieved significant growth in its first year under the Lionsgate banner. Love it, love it, love it. Brought to you by three major studios, Epix, the next generation premium service available on TV and online, has reached an unprecedented deal with Netflix that allows subscribers to get hit films streaming on the web. Boom! Delivering movies and original programming to viewers anywhere, anytime. You don't see it on cable? You can catch it on the computer, isn't that genius? That's the way everything's moving now. Oh yeah. You see that, did you? giving people not just what they want now, <laughs> but what they want next. No way. Yes way. Lionsgate is opening the way to the future, giving us the choices we want. I just want everything to be perfect. The entertainment we love to see. It all comes together from one studio, one vision, Original, award-winning, unforgettable. Look for us. Lionsgate. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you again for being here. So a few weeks ago, I had the pleasure of taking my oldest daughter, Jillian, for her first day of college. And uh, she's going to my alma mater, Washington University, as Kevin mentioned, in St. Louis. It's a wonderful school. And Lori and I love being there with Jillian, just to do the simple things, set up her bed, her bookshelves, to meet a roommate, and to attend her first orientation meeting. But as we prepared to say goodbye, Jillian seemed very nervous. She held on to us and didn't want to let us go. You know, just a few months before, she was that confident high school graduate, enjoying her summer, her friends, and yes, her new car. She seemed to have all the answers, but now she was starting over. She was facing new challenges, and she would need to come up with new relationships, new friends, and new answers. And I thought, you know, that's just like me. 
Every time I think I've got this down, something happens and I have to start all over. Every time I think I have all of the answers, it's time to go back to the drawing board. And every time I'm comfortable that things won't change, they do. Because the only constant in our business is change. That's what I'd like to talk to you about this afternoon, how we look at change, how we respond to it, and how we make it our strength. Now, when we talk about change in our business, let's keep two things in mind. First, change isn't new. Our industry changes each day with each new format, every fresh business model, and every newly discovered market. Changes with every single piece of content we produce and distribute. Every show has a different cast, creative team, production schedule, and network or cable home. And every one of them operates according to its own creative rhythm, financial and economic calculus, and talent architecture. So change is part of our daily life. But also, let's remember what hasn't changed, and that's the demand for content. People are watching more television than ever. The number of viewers is growing, the number of hours is increasing, and the number of ways they're watching is expanding exponentially. The worldwide television market grew to 1.2 billion households last year. Television viewership worldwide reached a record three hours, 12 minutes of daily consumption. And in the United States, I'm embarrassed to say, it grew to an incredible five hours and 19 minutes. Now, whatever I may think about that as a parent and as a taxpayer, it has to warm my heart as an executive. The demand is there at record levels. The consumers are there in record numbers, and the content is available in record supply. But what has changed and what has us worried is the way people consume content. They view it now in large affinity groups or as part of large niche demographic audiences. And they have multiple viewing choices under the same roof. Sometimes in our house, it still looks like the old days of television. The show that brings the whole family together around the TV set is Glee. After Glee, the kids scatter to watch their shows, and Lori and I watch Mad Men together. But when she gets to the Kardashians, or the Rachel Zoe Project, I'm gone, and then it's every man for himself. Now, we have enough televisions in our house to accommodate this diversity of programming, but around the world, more people are getting the opportunity to see more content than ever before on their cell phones, their iPads, and hundreds of other devices. They want their content when, where, and how they want it, and the good news is, they're willing to pay more for it, if it's premium, if it's faster, sooner, more mobile, or more transportable. In the April to June quarter, while cable subscribers are down very slightly, subscribers have bought more premium packages than ever. DirecTV's profit was up 33%, due in part to the growing popularity of NFL Sunday Ticket, which now has over 2 million subscribers. Now, $320 is a lot of money for NFL Sunday Ticket. But one of the lessons of today's marketplace is that premium content does command premium value. So what's the problem? Lots of buyers, a growing customer base, major new digital players, an expanding array of services. Add it all up, doesn't sound like there's much cause for concern. But in a world where the old advertiser-supported models of big audiences are migrating towards hundreds of affinity niches, where the traditional linear progression of Windows is increasingly challenged, and the emergence of digital online video is threatening the traditional ways we monetize our content. We have plenty of questions that are keeping us all awake at night. I can remember when you only needed to create a hit show for one of the three or four broadcast networks in the US, a show that would be acceptable to a large, diverse audience. You got one license fee that paid for most of the show, international put you, uh, sales put you in profits, then you did one big syndication deal and you were all done. It was a lot harder to make a mistake. There were favored nations clauses, all kinds of historical deals and precedents to rely on, and you had existing personal relationships on which you could depend. Today, most shows must make an audience out of a, out of, make a business out of an audience that is far less broad, but has far more passion. An audience that will not only watch the show when it premieres, but TiVo it, download it to iTunes, buy it on DVD, and watch it on their cell phones. So we need to build new economic models that accommodate this new entertainment paradigm. And this is where we get nervous. We need to create new relationships, relationships with people who install telephone lines and build mobile networks, relationships with billionaire Mark Zuckerberg, 26 years old, who connects millions of people through bits and bytes. And when we speak to them, we need to monetize these new relationships 
And the problem is, we don't know how. What should we charge for our content over these new distribution systems? What about terms? What about exclusivity? There are no precedents, there are no models, there are no defined terms and conditions. So we have to take a chance, we have to take risks, and we have to be willing to make mistakes. Perhaps the best show on television today, Mad Men, was a show for which AMC had a tough time finding a studio partner, a hard to finance period piece. But we cobbled together a new business model built on a patchwork quilt of basic cable, DVD sales, iTunes downloads, international sales, and a half a dozen other digital delivery platforms, and we came up with a formula that will ultimately deliver millions of dollars an episode. Some of the ways we finance these new models will cause strain. Our traditional partners may feel encroached upon, their real estate threatened by new players. But throughout the history of our business, change has inspired existing companies to adapt, open the door for new companies to innovate, and at each step of the way, our industry has become bigger and better. Our product is renewable, our businesses are resilient, and our consumers' appetite for content is reliable. And our opportunity is to layer our traditional partners with new partners, to build new platforms, define new windows, establish more flexible pricing, and ultimately create a win-win scenario for all. Epix, our new pay television venture with Viacom, Paramount, and uh, MGM, is just such a service. For Lionsgate, it was an opportunity to build a valuable and successful pay television channel that would give us control of our own destiny, allow us to monetize the value of our content, get closer to our uh, uh, customers, and effectively allow us to exchange lower multiple license fee revenue for much higher multiple equity value. Epix is working. It has achieved one of the fastest accelerations from startup to profitability of any channel in history, profitable after only 10 months of operation. And any doubts about its value or willingness to challenge convention were dispelled when we announced our recent deal with Netflix, carving out a new window for streaming movies 90 days after they debut on traditional premium pay television, a deal which media and analyst reports have valued at close to a billion dollars. The Epix Netflix deal tells us several things about our business. It tells us that new windows carry a lot of promise and potential for content creators, distributors, and consumers alike. It tells us that the digital rights to our content carry tremendous value. And it tells us that every time we face a market in which traditional buyers are offering less for our content, the financial equilibrium of our business creates new buyers who are willing to pay more. As we, Viacom and MGM, all looked at the paradigm of tying up all the subscription pay television rights for a seven-year window in a world of significant and accelerating change, the ability to control and redefine the timing and pricing of these pay windows seemed right for us. We created the 90-day window after talking with our initial traditional distributors, Verizon, Cox, and Dish among them, in order to allow them the early premium window for our films, and then 90 days later, we expand our footprint via Netflix distribution. So we've respected the, the relationship with historical partners, brought in a new well-financed digital partner to expand our distribution, and ultimately created a business model that will allow us to support our investment in producing high consumer value content. There's nothing sacrosanct about the 90 days we're all exploring new windows and new pricing models, particularly in the VOD space. And even traditional MSOs are open to new partners in order to distribute their content. I note that DirecTV Sunday Ticket is now being made available through broadband for those customers who can't get their satellite service. And as part of NBC's recent estimated $600 million deal with Netflix, Saturday Night Live will be made available to Netflix subscribers the day after broadcast. The Epix Netflix deal reflects the premium value of our content in a digital world where content companies will have numerous alternatives to get their product to the consumer and to monetize it. In the U.S., the audience with the fastest growing appetite for content is the Hispanic population. The 26 million Latino moviegoers in the U.S. make, more than, make up more than one-fourth of America's frequent moviegoers. So last month, we launched Panaleon Films with our partner Televisa to serve this audience. We're partnering with the largest Spanish-language media company in the world, and we're bringing films to the Latino moviegoer with consistency and on a, scale previously un, uh, on a scale previously unprecedented, eight to 10 films a year in English and Spanish for five years. 
We're approaching the venture with the same corporate values we bring to all of our initiatives, a dominant world-class partner in Televisa, an entrepreneurial executive team led by Jim McNamara and Paul Pressburger, delivering branded content to a targeted audience. The fragmentation of audiences may be difficult news for old world business models, but it's good news for companies like ours because it signals the continued expansion of potentially profitable niches for which our branded content and targeted approach are a better fit. Some of the markets that we're targeting are further from home. We're generating only 1% of our nearly $2 billion a year in revenue from the vast consumer populations of China, India, and the other Asian territories who make up 50% of the world population. And we knew we had to do something else. So we formed Tigergate, a joint venture with Saban Capital Group and my entrepreneurial friends, Chaim Saban and Adam Chesnoff, to capture a larger share of the fast-growing Asian pay television market. Led by a trusted and equally entrepreneurial executive, William Pfeiffer, we launched Thriller Heart, uh, Horror Thriller Channel and Kicks an Asian Action Channel. And after one year, these channels are up in Hong Kong, Indonesia, Singapore, and we're in negotiation to launch in many other territories. The key to the success of Tigergate and any of our other ventures going forward will be the ability to recognize the changing viewing patterns of the audience and to develop content, channels, and brands that fit them. When you think about it, these simple rules apply equally to creating content in the new world order. If you look at the iconic brands dominating television today, Shows like Boardwalk Empire, Burn Notice, Breaking Bad, Spartacus Californication, and our own Mad Men and Nurse Jackie, they all have one thing in common in addition to their loyal audiences and rave reviews. They all average fewer than five million viewers, just like Nip Tuck, Monk, and the tutors before them. But they all represent premium content, and they will all have an extended lifespan in many different markets and windows. These brands are defined as much by the depth of their core audience as the breadth of their popularity. Weeds, our hit show on Showtime, averages two million viewers. But in addition to more than $100 million in DVD revenue, it has also dominated iTunes charts, is available for streaming on Netflix's Watch Instantly service, and is sold by episode or season on Amazon, Zoom, Cinema Now, Movie Link, and Vudu. Overall, it has already generated nearly five million digital transactions and counting. Now, it is a lot harder to make money with a show that has only 5 million viewers than one that has 25 million. But the combination of analog dollars and digital pennies is adding up pretty quickly. As our business changes, so do all the indices of success. Shows will be prized for the loyalty of their viewers and their ability to migrate to multiple platforms that generate extended revenue streams, not just their ability to reach tens of millions of eyeballs at a single sitting. As we've seen with Tyler Perry, Premium content is distinguishable more by its value as a repeatable brand than by the magnitude of its initial impact. Tyler's one of the most unique talents in the entertainment industry today, and while many of you may not have heard of him, listen to these numbers. $483 million in worldwide theatrical box office for his first nine films. 40 million DVDs sold of his films and stage plays. 3,000 stage performances over the past 12 years attended by 20 million customers and more than 6 million weekly viewers for his two television shows. The point is that with a fan base of only 20 to 30 million people, he can be one of the most successful artists and entrepreneurs in the world. Tyler and Debmore Mercury created a brand new model for his shows that was both risky and different. They took the chance to produce and distribute 10 episodes of his first television show, House of Pain, with no network attached. And look what they got. An initial 100 episode order for House of Pain and another 100 episodes of its spin-off, Meet the Browns, airing first on TBS and then within two years airing in an accelerated syndication window led by the Fox Station Group. In just two years, those orders have grown to 352 episodes for the two shows. And Tyler's TV shows alone have generated nearly half a billion dollars in revenue, almost exclusively from the United States. And that's what I call repeatable business. All of this focus on niche audience isn't to say that the network business isn't still relevant, and the strong upfront performances this year reinforce that. Shows like Modern Family and Glee prove that the networks haven't lost their touch in creating quality, enduring programming, even if the ratings that define a hit today are much smaller than they were 10 years ago. And if we've learned one lesson already from this year's network season, it's that content and the internet continue to intersect in new and interesting ways in the brave new world of television. The new CBS show, 
bleep, my dad says, was taken, uh, was taken from a Twitter feed and turned into a hit by one of the few uh, constants in our business today. Find something avant-garde, cutting edge, fresh and relevant, and then just drop William Shatner into the middle of it. Whether it's a big star vehicle for 20 million viewers or a niche cable show for 20,000 fans, the defining constant of content, wherever it appears and whoever the audience is, is that it needs to be good. Whether it's Jerry Bruckheimer making CSI for CBS, Lionsgate producing Mad Men for AMC, or Gustavo Bolivar producing Sintetos No Hay Paraíso for Colombian television, which for some reason has become a big hit sensation in Latin America, there are certain rules about content that don't change. The first of these rules, get it right the first time. If you create the right content, the buyers, sponsors, partners, and audience will follow. When you're making a show, don't let the results you want to achieve shape the content. Let the content shape the results. I remember back fondly to one of the only international co-productions done with the U.S. Broadcast Network, a co-production uh, that we did at New World with ABC, TF1, and London Weekend Television called A Fine Romance. It was great fun trying to include all of the different voices, and while we got the show on everywhere, it didn't last long anywhere. The moral of the story is don't make a deal, make a show. When you create a show to fit the structure of a deal or to satisfy the needs of several different markets or a variety of audiences, the something for everyone approach usually leads to nothing for anyone. Now it's fine to have shows with lots of buyers as long as they share a unified vision. Pillars of the Earth, which debuted on stars in the US, followed anything but a traditional path to the screen. It was a book that I read and loved over 20 years ago, and it finally made it to the screen because its producers pieced together financing, led by licenses to ProSieben in Germany, CBC and the Movie Network in Canada, Soke Kabla in Spain, ORT in Austria, and TV2 in Hungary, all before it was attached to a US broadcast or cable network. Stanley Park is a pilot that we produced in the UK for the BBC, and although it's a fantastic show, its fate remains uncertain in the UK. However, we screened the completed pilot for the Fox network in the US, and they loved it. We just concluded a deal to adapt it to the US market, and the writer-creator, Leo Richardson, is now in Los Angeles working on the pilot script. These shows have a single unifying thread. If you make good content in a world marketplace that is hungry for it, you'll find plenty of buyers, as long as you don't limit yourself to old models. Least common denominator, television just doesn't work. The shows with the least longevity and the most limited appeal are, ironically, the ones that set out to pander to the widest and most diverse audiences. But a successful show in any territory will almost inevitably lead to success in other territories. It will live on in sequels, be sold as a format, and will, live, will have an afterlife in syndication. Two decades after its debut on network television, Seinfeld's fans and progeny live on in Larry David's Curb Your Enthusiasm, which is enjoying a new life with original material created each episode on our TV Guide network. 42 years after its first network premiere, Dano is booking big audiences again as the retooled Hawaii Five-0 was an early ratings winner for CBS. From Bewitched to The Fugitive, The Honeymooners to Get Smart, the list goes on and on. The message is clear, get it right the first time and they will come for generations. Look at the hit series Modern Family and Glee. While syndication may now be defined more broadly as three or four platforms sharing the back end, these shows amazingly sold into syndication for big numbers in only their second season. But when someone else gets it right, don't expect to duplicate their success by using the same concept and the same formula. Because the corollary of get it right the first time is Me Too television just doesn't work. There are a million great scripts waiting to be written, produced and distributed. Be original because there's only one survivor, only one American Idol, there's only one Sopranos, and only one Mad Men. Great television shows are a testament to the power of a bold idea conceived with genius and executed with skill. Me Too television has no longevity, but fresh, original, and daring shows are the gifts that keep on giving. There's just one more rule I'd like to talk about that probably applies to all of us. I can remember when I was given the first draft of the pilot episode of Wonder Years when I was at A New World in 1988. <clears throat> if you all recall, it won an Emmy for Best Comedy after only six episodes on the air. I took the script home and read it and shared it with a few close friends whose opinions I trusted, and we all agreed that it was very special. 
And then I made one of the best executive decisions I've ever made. I left it alone. I didn't touch the script. I didn't influence the casting. I didn't argue with the showrunner's choice of director. That's right. I just let the creative process work its magic, and I stayed out of the way. Sometimes we lose sight of the fact that as executives, we're only the facilitators of the creative process. We're not the story. We're not the audience, just the connection between the two. Our job, just to bring the storyteller and his or her audience together in the most efficient, effective, and entertaining ways possible. For all the new formats in the world, all the new technologies delivering them, and all the new markets for consuming them, our business is still built on stories and the best ways to tell them. What did we learn from this uh, past 3D summer at the theatrical box office? We learned that advanced technology properly harnessed can make a good story even better. It can help it achieve its resonance, extend its reach, and not so parenthetically, boost its profit margins in the process. But even the state of the art and technology cannot make ordinary content extraordinary. And the greatest magic in our creative arsenal remains our storytellers' gifts for capturing our imaginations. Now, no matter how much our business changes, that simple truth won't. Change seems a little scary to all of us, just as it did to my daughter, Jillian. And change is hard. Launching epics, especially in the midst of a recession and the face of industry skepticism, was difficult. Cracking the Latino moviegoer market and the Asian pay television markets would be tough. Growing TV Guide into a leading general entertainment channel is a great challenge. And cobbling together the various analog and digital revenue streams for the next Mad Men or Weeds will make me long for the simpler broadcast network paradigm of generations ago. But there's no going back, and the status quo isn't an option for success in a world evolving as rapidly and a business changing as profoundly as ours. Like the blind men measuring the elephant, we're still trying to figure out the most basic elements of the digital content equation. But over time, I am confident that we will get it right. And we're going to find that the new era of our television business is more promising for our companies, more exciting for our consumers, and more rewarding for all of us than anything that has preceded it. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Anna Karugati. I'm the group editorial director of World Screen. I am absolutely delighted to be here, and I thank the executives at Lionsgate and at Reed Medium for asking me to conduct this question and answer session with, with John. Um, I first met John in the middle 90s. He was at Sony. I was a lot greener as a reporter back then. He was a top studio executive, and I was a little nervous. He answered my questions beautifully. He was very kind, and it was a phone interview, and I hung up, and that was it. I wrote my article, and then I came to the market, and the article that I had written was published in World Screen that was being exhibited here at, at the market. Coincidentally, I had to go up to the Sony booth to meet another executive, and I was waiting for the hostess at the booth to go get this other executive, and I see a gentleman come out. Now, I had never met John in person. I had only speak, spoken to him on the phone. And I see an executive come out, and I see his badge, and the first thing I think was, oh my god, I screwed up. I got something wrong. Instead, he came up to me. He shook my hand, and he said, hello, I wanted to introduce myself. Anna, thank you for interviewing me. You did a great job. You got it right. And that was my first impression of John. He is a wonderful person. And now, in my questions and answers, I hope you get to see a little more of the person that he is beyond the amazing company that he's built. So ladies and gentlemen, once again, John Feldheimer. Well, I'd really like to learn about your background as a singer and songwriter, but we'll get to that later. <laughs> I thought we'd start. Let's go back in time a little bit to when you took the reins of Lionsgate. Was, it, was targeting unserved niche audiences something that you had already thought of? And how did all that come about? Because that's certainly a strength that you've built the company upon. Yeah. Well, I think it was kind of what was left for us, you know. <laughs> The studios had, uh, you know, done a pretty good job of figuring out how to do broad-based 
entertainment. It seemed to me that, again, people were even 10 years ago watching uh, television, watching movies uh, more in, in large you know, affinity groups than uh, they had done before. And it seemed like an interesting opportunity for us to be able to do with less capital uh, and with a perhaps more focused approach to how to reach those, those niche audiences. Mad Men, Weeds, Nurse Jackie, Running Wilds, The Tyler Perry Show, just to mention a few, are not ordinary shows by any stretch of the imagination, by any definition. What kind of creative environment do producers and writers find at Lionsgate? You know, we have a, a much smaller staff, I think, than most studios, and I think that both uh, the, the kind of empowerment that we give our executives is very similar to how we treat showrunners. Um, we don't believe we... Uh, we write the scripts, and as I said about Wonder Years, I think that's probably not that atypical. I think that we want the writers and showrunners to uh, do what they do, and I think we try to guide them. We work with the networks. We try to help make sure we can market them, uh, get them out to the, you know, to, to the right audience at the right uh, time. But at, at the end of the day, I think they're given a lot of freedom to create. And consequently, given the reputation of the shows that you have produced, what reputation does Lionsgate have in the creative community? Well, you know, um, you're, you're only as good as your last hit, and so I think if people look at, at Nurse Jackie and, and Mad Men and Weeds, I think perhaps, you know, we have a, a pretty good reputation as a company that cares about quality, that gives showrunners uh, and, and talent the opportunity to be empowered and, and follow their own creative uh, direction. Uh, so I think we have a, I think we have a very good uh, reputation. I think we have an entrepreneurial reputation. I think we've been mostly involved with shows that I'm proud of, and, and I think certainly we always try to do uh, the best that we can, and, and perhaps not, not try to always attract the money as much as get the show right and then figure that we'll figure out how to, to bring the money in through various uh, platforms. Now, I know that Lionsgate is known for being cost conscious, and careful about how you spend your money. And yet, how do you ensure that you get quality on the screen, whether it be the big theatrical screen or the small television screen, and still watch those dollars? Yeah, I'm not so sure Carl Icahn agrees that uh, we're <laughs> pinching the pennies that much. But, uh, you know, I think the interesting thing about it is you can't be that much smarter than anybody else. Um, you know, we do use a lot of uh, tax credits. We've made interesting deals in New Mexico and uh, Pennsylvania. Uh, we're pretty mobile about where we shoot our shows. We don't have a big studio lot. We don't feel compelled to use a studio lot. Uh, but I think the main thing is to make sure that you just do shows that you know you can produce efficiently. And so you've got to turn down. There's, there were a couple of shows this year that I remember Kevin brought to me and we talked about them. And they just seemed like great shows, but they seemed like shows that really weren't for us, that we couldn't do the best that we could do. And so we said, uh, you know, to the creator, you, you may be better off somewhere else. So I think it's very much picking the shows that you think you know how to do, where you can do them, how are you going to do them, to be efficient, to be able to be profitable, but to do great shows. Okay. Now, you mentioned during your speech, which, by the way, I've been lucky enough to do a lot of Q&As after keynotes, and that was an extraordinary speech. Thank I'm not just much. saying it really Thank was. When you mentioned about how years ago uh, you could make a show, sell it in the U.S., recoup most of your production costs, International was icing on the cake and your profit, and then if you got a syndication deal, you were living happy. Tell me, what was the time frame for that process compared to today, that quilt patchwork deals that you have to make for a, a cable, or maybe more than one cable, and the windowing, and the iTunes, and the Netflix, What's the time span well, today? Well, surprisingly enough, it, it, it could just be that the old model was slower in some ways uh, because you did have to look all the way through to syndication uh, to even believe that there was going to be a profit. If you didn't have your show on for at least, I would say, four years, uh, you might never get there or your back-end value would be so diminished. Right now, we're looking at the possibility of being profitable well before that. It just requires a lot more... Uh, arm wrestling with a lot of different platforms, uh, but you might get there. And some of the choices we made, for example, Running Wild, one of the reasons that uh, we decided to, to go ahead and produce that show was that we had seen with Arrested Development how significant the DVD 
revenue was and thought if we can keep the show on for a couple of years, uh, we can actually be in profits significantly earlier. So I, I think it's interesting. One would think it was the opposite. Uh, it was perhaps uh, safer in some ways, or at least it was simpler, but not necessarily faster. Okay. It wasn't necessarily a faster path to profitability. Interesting. Um, the last two years have not been easy for anybody in the media industry, given the downturn and the advertising slowdown. Um, certainly, it's not been easy for independents. Um, first, the credit crunch, as I said, the sluggish ad market, the economy. How did you navigate those difficult times? Because you've come out of it in a good position, haven't you? Yeah, I think um, we took our, our lumps like everybody else. Uh, 2008, early 2009, th those, were, those were pretty rough years. But uh, I think the key thing for us is diversification. We never set out to be a film company. We never set out to be a television company. We built a very large library early on. It throws off about $100 million of free cash flow every year. Uh, and it enables us to actually make sure that we can pay everybody and that we can, uh, we can uh, obviously fulfill all of our obligations. And uh, you know, it's worked pretty well. Some years, even some quarters, uh, the film business carries us. Then the next quarter, it may be the television business. Uh, DVD has been actually pretty solid for us. We still convert at a very high level. So um, I think diversification. Okay. Do you care to talk about your singer-songwriter past now? <laughs> wasn't that much to talk about. I wasn't, I wasn't that bad, I just wasn't that good. Okay, all right. otherwise was, was that a career option for you for a while? Could have worked. What, college or high school or when was it? Uh, well, college and after that. And do you dabble in it now? Did I what? Do you dabble in it now? Do you sing or so right? <laughs> you know, there's a rumor that I've got an electric guitar in my office and that uh, every now and then I pick it up and, and play it, but um, I can't confirm that rumor. You won't come? Oh, darn it. Call okay. Mickey Fink. No. no. <laughs> now I'm here. You can give me the scoop. Um, I have, as you know, I've interviewed you several times. I've interviewed many of your executives over the years. And the word on the street is, is that you're a really nice guy to work for. So share with us a little bit, what's your management style like? How do you get the best out of the people who work for you? Well, I'm glad to hear that you say that. And I hope my wife is listening to that. But um, I don't know. I, again, I think people tend to care more. It's, this is people probably, a lot of people in the audience say, no, that's not true. But I think at the, at the end of the day, the most important thing is not how much you pay people. It's how much you respect them. And the way you show how much you respect them is by letting them make decisions, giving them the ability to make mistakes. That was you know, part of my speech. I really believe that. And, and I think what does sometimes happen, uh, maybe more and more established organizations that have big legacy for 50, 60, 70 years, um, you know, I think there's perhaps less of that. It, you know, it, it's a little more mechanized. And I think that um, I tend to let people make mistakes. And sometimes afterwards, if it is a mistake, I kick myself. Why didn't I exert more influence over that decision? But I think that's where the magic comes from. The magic comes from entrepreneurial people who really can take ideas that other people haven't thought of that therefore look like they're probably a mistake and make them, you know, make them work. That's the whole game as far as I'm concerned. Um, over the many times that I've, well, the few times that I've interviewed you, I think my final question to you has always been, are you satisfied with <laughs> what you've built up to now? So I know Kevin made mention of this earlier. I have to ask you, are, are you satisfied and what else do you still want to do that you haven't done yet? Well, you know the answer. You know, the answer is uh, I'm definitely not satisfied. I love the growth that we've got in our television business. I love the growth we've had in our channel platforms. I think the international marketplace uh, is very exciting right now. And I think, as I've, I've certainly said before, I think there's a digital explosion about to happen. I think, again, our Netflix deal, the NBC Netflix deal, every day now you're reading about Netflix, but it's not just Netflix. Uh, you know, it's Amazon and Microsoft, and you're going to start seeing uh, a Google, obviously. You're going to start seeing significant deals being made by these companies. It's not necessarily a replacement for the traditional distributors, um, but there's big, big, big money there. And these guys have huge install bases and, and tremendous uh, tr tremendous connection with the consumer. And I think once we tap into this together, um, there's uh, an amazing amount of uh, money on a worldwide basis 
that we can actually generate. And I think that's very exciting. So no, I'm not satisfied, but I'm happy. Well, that's good. Are there areas of opportunity that you see as you steer the company forward in, in what is very much uncharted territory, isn't there? Because you know, today it's Facebook and Twitter, and who knows what it's going to be tomorrow, and what device, you know, it's the iPad, and what will Google come out with? Yeah, again, I think people don't understand this, this point about precedence and favored nations. So when, you know, who knew that when we made our, our deal with Netflix, for example, for Epix, who knew that there wasn't another billion of uh, dollars sitting there that we left, uh, you know, we left on the table? You don't know, because you can't compare it to some other deal uh, that they that they did and so again I think that's the uncharted territory that's so exciting that's going to be so interesting uh, that's really the new frontier of what we're, we're talking about again as I say the demand is there the demand is there and I think you know you, you always hear people say oh a television used to be better 10 years ago 20 years ago it's television's never been better it's the, the best it's ever been by far it's not even close you've got great content being created all over the all over the world um, so you know, I, I think we're going into a tremendous period of, of growth for the business and for our company. I'm very excited about it. I can see a couple of two or three or four different interesting companies that, that uh, with whom we might partner, but I'm not going to tell you who. Another <laughs> scoop you're not giving me. But uh, I do think they're they're out there. I think uh, there are other entrepreneurial, uh, entrepreneur like minded uh, companies out there that would be interested to do other deals with, to partner with. Uh, to be in business with, and, uh, and, and I think you know, those are the things we're looking at right now. What's more difficult, deciding a new, a new way to navigate this uncharted territory and make a new deal, or dropping your daughter off to college and see her go? Well, dropping my daughter off, as I said, that was, uh, that was a great experience, actually. It was, uh, it was a little scary for us. It was obviously uh, a little scarier for her. Um, I think the family, the hardest thing I ever do, I've got a four-year-old. I've got an 18-year-old and I've got a four-year-old, so <laughs> the hardest thing I do is navigating around those kids. I think my wife would, would say the same thing. But uh, no, our business is actually at a crossroads. I think it's, it is difficult right now, but I think, again, there's a lot of magic left for us to all create, and I'm looking forward to being a part of it. And finally, you're back at MIPCOM after a number of years. How does it feel to be back? It feels great. It feels great. Well, we had two great days of weather and one not so great. But you know, I love pulling down the, the quasette and seeing so many people from so many different countries um, engaging in the uh, monetization of our of our content. I think it's very exciting, and each has a different priority. And um, you know, I, I love the energy. I, I love the the action. It's uh, it's great to be back. It's great to have you here. Well, everybody, please thank John Held. Thank you. Thank you all very much. I appreciate it. Thank you.